Welcome to another episode in the Cohesive Home Interviews series. In today's episode, Melissa interviews Sarah Copper. She's the co-host of both the Friendlier and Family Pedals podcasts. She's an advocate for car-free family transportation, a writer, and a mother of two. I think you'll really enjoy their conversation and hopefully be inspired to look at bicycling as a family totally differently. Now on with the show. I am so excited to have you on, Sarah. Um, I would just love for you to share a bit about yourself with our community to uh, let them know your backstory. My name is Sarah Copper, and right now I live in Bloomington, Indiana, with my husband and our two children. They are five and three, so a new kindergartner, so entering a new phase of life as a family. And we live car-free, so we sold our car about eight years ago, and since then have been walking and biking and figuring that out through two pregnancies and wow. life with kids up yeah. to the present. Wow. Well, so I actually can relate slightly. <laughs> when we lived in Germany, we did not own a car. So we had the the push chair that was also the bike, you mm-hmm. know, c- you know, connected to our bikes. And so we either pulled or pushed our kids everywhere. But, you know, our kids, we stuffed all three of them into one bicycle wow. <laughs> pool. <laughs> they were smaller then. And so we kind of made it work. But how are you guys? So it's been eight years of being car mm-hmm. free. Um, what I guess we should start with what kind of spurred you guys into making that big of a life change because obviously in this day and age that is not common it was definitely an evolution over several years so i didn't mention this in the intro but i actually have a podcast about living car free and car light and in the very first episode i go into detail about how both my husband and i got to where we are but it started for me my freshman year of college when i broke my arm And I was not able to drive my car. I drove a stick shift and it was my right arm and I just was not physically possible. (laughs) (laughs) And so then I was forced to walk places that I would have just gotten in my car without thinking. And doing that made me realize this is more relaxing and more enjoyable than getting in my car. I found the experience overall less stressful and even after I got my cast off, I wanted to keep doing that. And I wanted to keep that feeling going. So that summer, I started biking more, biking to and from work, still incorporating walking. And then I went abroad and lived in Switzerland. And probably maybe similar to what you had experienced in Germany, it's a whole different mindset there of how you think about transportation. Yes, And that cars are not prioritized the same way they are here in the States. Just things like being at a crosswalk and having cars stop for me, Mm -hmm. that was very novel. Mm -hmm. Cars did not stop at crosswalks where I was growing up. (laughs) And I I would be, you know, everyone else would be going and I'm just waiting because I'm assuming they're going. And um, that whole, uh, so many people there were without a car and so many people were making that work and just seeing a different way of not just going one place, but really of structuring your whole life around that. Um, And then I came back and I started dating my now husband and he started getting interested in it too. And once he started biking for transportation, I mean, he went from zero to 100% over the course of a summer and pushed me and challenged me to go further than I had been doing on my own. I would say that I had been dabbling before (laughs) and that he took it to the next level of commitment And shortly after that, we moved to Oregon for grad school, and it was a place that was just so supportive of that. And so it felt easy to get around the town we were living in, and we figured, why not try it? Right now, we don't have kids, and we know we can make this work here, and we could always change our minds later, but this felt like, it felt like the perfect opportunity to at least try and see if we could make it work. And and cheaper, I would assume, as well. Yes, that was a big motivation going 
going into it. And I feel like it has been such a help to us as starting careers and with me staying home with our kids in terms of really making that possible financially. Yeah. Yeah. Because where do you live now? You're in Bloomington, Indiana. Indiana. So, and you were in a couple different places, obviously, while the evolution of this was happening, but Mm -hmm. have you found it difficult or more difficult in certain areas? Because I know I heard on one of your other podcasts, you were talking about the urban sprawl Mm -hmm. and how, you know, difficult that is if you're not living in the city center or in, you know, any sort of urban environment. Uh, How did you kind of make that work in other areas? It's been a learning process and location is so key to that, that when we lived in Austin, we actually bought a house that was still within the radius that we had picked for ourselves, but we learned that we had drawn that radius a little bit too big. (laughs) And we moved to that house about about three weeks before my son was born. And that was a hard year. He couldn't be on a bike and we weren't in a really walkable location. And my husband's commute was longer. And we ended up renting out that house and renting a house closer in. Oh my and goodness. that made it easier. Yeah. And it was worth it to us to have to switch houses and deal with all the logistics to simplify that aspect of our lives. We'll talk about living by your values. You're like, we're making a decision to change this. I mm-hmm. love that. I love it. <laughs> so often people just think of like their situations as being stuck. And you're like, no, they're think think harder (laughs) like there Mm -hmm. might be another option so the fact that you guys did that to make this thing that you valued so possible that's so awesome so okay so then you had your son Mm -hmm. and you're in Austin you moved to at some point moved to uh, Bloomington yes and then you add a second Mm -hmm. child and so how is that how is adding two kids into a car free I mean did you at some point go we need to buy a car. Mm, I would say that we definitely entertained the idea yeah. that it was on the table. And Neil, my husband, he always recognized that really the burden of being car free once we had kids was on me because I was the one that was home with them and limited by how we could get them around. And that is why he was so supportive when I was pregnant with our daughter and said, we need a move. I can't have two kids in this location. And that's when we went to the more central location. And I think just being willing to be really flexible and creative and to not see things as a dead end. And I I think it did help me to know, okay, we always could buy a car, which is a very privileged place to be, to this is an act of choice for us. It's not something forced upon us. And having that out, I think in some ways it also helped me commit more to it. I know we could do this, but I really, I want to make it work. And as Neil always says, he sees it as a fun challenge as opposed to a burden. And to go back to your question about how it was adding another child to the mix, I actually think it was easier the second time Because I had so much more perspective Mm -hmm. that the first year was the hardest year. It we didn't bike with our kids until they were close to eleven months, and that is the more limiting time where you're relying on the bus or walking and keeping your radius much smaller. And with my son, I think that everything. I knew it was a short time period, but it feels so long, new motherhood, and it can be isolating, and I'm figuring all those things out, where with my daughter, it was, okay, we can do this, it's just for a year, and we had set ourselves up to be in a better position to make that easier on ourselves as well. Yeah. So were you in Indiana by the time you had your daughter? I was in Austin then and moved to Indiana when she was about nine months. Okay. I have to ask just a logistical question here. Mm -hmm. Um, Please do. Austin, it's hot in Austin. Yes. I know this for a fact. (laughs) (laughs) Um, My brother got married there in May and it is hot. Um, Yes. So how is that? You know, you're making this choice mm-hmm. because, I mean, you, like you said, it is it's a privilege. It is something that you have the um, luxury of choosing to be car-free. 
and yet it doesn't really seem like a luxury thing, right? You're you're like, I'm choosing to sweat all the way to the library. <laughs> um, did that ever deter you? Hmm. I, so I think that I definitely embrace the sweatiness yeah. <laughs> in Austin and that they're just accepting some of those, um, that with that choice comes certain things. Yeah. And one of it is arriving kind of gross and disgusting yeah. a lot of places yeah. <laughs> that I went in Austin. But also, you feel that same way just even on the walk to and from your car. And it's a different degree. But I think in some ways with the heat in Austin, it felt easier because we were in it so much more. And a as opposed to going from one air-conditioned place to another, I think in some ways my body acclimated to it. And... um. Yeah. No, I get that. I get that because, I mean, in Germany, granted, it was beautiful weather most of the time, even the winters, because we were in the south. So even the winters were not that harsh. But people thought, oh, even Germans told us, oh, you need a car. You need a car. <laughs> and yes, there were definitely times we rented a car to go places because it would have been nice. We were in a very small town. So we mm -hmm. we lived in a walkable town, but it was still a small town. Um, so to go anywhere else, it was either train or bus or, you know, renting a car. So, um, it, I don't know. I, I can see how your body would acclimate to those temperature changes. So I could go on. That's basically a rabbit hole, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, okay. So back to the point you guys are at this point, you're in Indiana, you are, you know, gung ho with keeping with, you know, car free living, um, had you started your podcast by that point? I had not. So the podcast is relatively new. I knew that I wanted to create some kind of platform to share stories of how we're making it work and how other families are making it work. Because when I had my son, I was really looking for more information yeah. and looking for people who were doing this so that I didn't feel like we were completely crazy exactly. that when most people found out we were pregnant, it was, oh, well, now you're going to have to get a car. Get that minivan. <laughs> right. And we didn't want to do that. But then I also wanted to hear more and see more from other people and normalize it for myself yeah. and to learn more. So I had that idea, but I didn't feel like I had the bandwidth to execute it until right. this past year. Cool. And I started another podcast with my friend, Abby, called Friendlier, and that's just a conversational podcast. But after I had started that and was thinking about creating this website with more written content, someone had suggested to me, why not make that into a podcast? And I thought, that's a great idea, that yeah. it's such a neat way to be able to have a conversation, let people listen in, and just a different way of reaching people. So... The idea for some sort of platform for sharing stories was there before, but it didn't really come into its own until this year. Yeah, because I would think that's definitely an you know a niche market where you you need that right. community. <laughs> you know, you this is where you find the like minded stories and how people are executing it in such different ways. Because I'm excited to listen in and hear people that are living it in different areas. Okay, so what does a typical day look like for your family on, you know, bicycles everywhere? Because I mean, I'm assuming your husband bikes to work. Does he have a job close by? You know, your kids are going to school. I'm so curious. Yes. My husband works about two miles from our house, and he bikes every day. I think if there were ever a tremendous amount of snow that he would walk in, but both the winters we've had here so far are fairly mild. So he's been able to keep biking all the way through. With the kids, we just started a new routine with school starting. So when my when we're dropping off my daughter, I usually take the kids in a cargo bike, which is the Madsen is the one that I prefer, which has the big bucket behind it and then bench seats for the kids. And we'll drop her off and then go to my son's school and drop him off. If it's a day where she is not in school, then he will ride his own bike and I'll push my daughter in the stroller to go to school. And sometimes he'll ride his own bike now. It's just a little bit longer when we're adding in the drop off of her too. <laughs> 
and he's definitely building up his stamina for doing longer rides. And then if I need to go anywhere, I just hop on my own bike to go. So overall, I would say my preference is to walk places. And we've been doing that a little bit more with pushing the stroller and having my son bike. But it's so much faster to bike and so much more efficient. And you can carry so much more. So for getting groceries, for example, we really need the cargo bike to be able to get a week's worth of groceries in there that would not be as effective in the stroller. But really, I feel like we're in a bit of a transition spot where before it was cargo bike all the time, my, neither kid could transport themselves. And now that my son is riding a pedal bike on his own, we're trying to give him more opportunities to ride on the road with us and to get more comfortable doing that with the shorter distances. So we're in a bit of an in-between phase. He's not totally independent, but he it's getting really heavy to have both of them in the cargo bike as they get older. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what are the ages of your kids, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, they're five and three. Okay. So yeah, so that was, when we were in Germany, it was, we had a three, a four, almost five, and a six-year-old. And all three of them, my husband would pull them in the bike carrier. I don't know. What do you call those things that where you hook them onto your bike? And it's like the, it can also the trailer. The trailer. Thank you. It can also be, yes. it's like the trailer or also a stroller. So like during the day, if I just had one of the kids, um, our youngest, he, he didn't go to school. So I would push him in the stroller and then we'd go get groceries and I'd fill half of it up with groceries <laughs> and the other half was him. So yeah, just finding the logistics of all of that has got to be uh, ever changing. So it is, and it's trial and error. And I think just being willing to be really flexible mm -hmm. and to know that things are often shifting, and what worked really well a few months ago may not be what works really well right now. Right. That sometimes the kids fight a lot in the cargo bike next to each other and it's better to have a different configuration and sometimes it's great and they entertain each other yeah. or um, sometimes they want to be on their own or not or walking or not so just trying to be willing to roll with it and be open to changing things because their needs and our needs are always shifting right well I'll just tell you right now we're a car family and my kids fight in the car so it's gonna happen no matter where yes <laughs> but yes I was recently talking to a guest about that about how I know that it would be the same yeah. if we were in a car yeah. but it feels so public on a yeah. bike it feels like we are just on display yes. and so when you're going down the bikeway <laughs> and your kids are crying I feel like it looks like we're torturing them to be on the bike it's supposed to be this fun activity and they don't look like they're having fun <laughs> but I here. do console myself that this happens to everyone no matter what form of transportation yes, yes this you are is so taking. true it's so true well because we actually have we have a Fiat like the 500L so it's a bigger one but when it's all five of us in there we all three of the kids are in the back seat and they are mm -hmm. very close to each other I and mean, their arms are touching. So people think we're crazy <laughs> for squeezing all three of our kids in the back seat, but that works. Um, that okay. Builds character. It <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, okay. So I have one last question for you. And this is something that, you know, I, I kind of, uh, you touched on a little bit on one of your podcasts. We just got back from a camping trip. And mm -hmm. that is something that now we're excited to do more of. We're like, oh, I want to camp. Well, when you camp, you need, I would assume, you need a car. We have the big cargo thing on the top of our car now because our car is small. And, you know, I'm thinking, how would a family like yours participate in these extracurricular activities? Um, I know that you can definitely go out and rent stuff and do things like that, but maybe going longer distances or doing something like camping, how has your family figured out how to do that and implement that in your family? That is a great question. I have several thoughts <laughs> swirling around in my brain related to that. Go for it. <laughs> um, one is recamping. I, I do think in general, making this choice, I think has overall enhanced our life and has helped us clarify our values and brought us a lot of joy that we weren't expecting along the way. Right. 
One thing that I think has been a challenge is how much we love being outside and doing hiking and canoeing and camping and that it is logistically more challenging to make that work as a car-free family. I think we could rent a car more often if we need to travel. That's what we do. And we could be doing that on the weekend to go on a camping trip. We have also gone bike camping that we met a friend via Craigslist, actually, because we were buying a cargo bike from him who said, oh, our family also goes bike camping. Would you like to come sometime? And he is on the podcast in September talking about bike camping as a family. And he takes a ton of trips doing that, even a 10 day tour of southern Indiana with his five and eight year old kids. That's cool. So as a family, we've gone camping. We try and do it twice a year. So we haven't actually gone yet this year, but we are planning to go in the fall. And we went twice in 2016. So we can't go as far. And it is a physical challenge Mm -hmm. (laughs) to carry all the stuff and the kids. But we have been able to make that work. Wow. It is just not going as far. And and that's something I really loved about being a car-free family is it stretched my conception of what is possible. And I've been really fortunate to have other friends who are also making these kind of choices who have opened my mind to ways of doing things. I had a guest on the show that moved her schoolhouse via bicycle, that she gathered tons of friends and with bikes because we're part of the bike community in Austin and loaded up all the stuff and moved her schoolhouse from her house three miles to its new location in this big bike caravan. Wow. And just things like that, that it wouldn't have even occurred to me, oh, we could do a move via bike. But you can. It's a challenge, but you can. And so that's one thing I love about it is that it's it's taught me to question the status quo and to not make assumptions that if you're doing this, you have to do it this way. That there are creative solutions if you're willing to look for them and willing to ask for help and to reach out to people and that's been a huge benefit to us is feeling more connected to our community. And I think having to be reliant on other people has enhanced our life. And that has made those ties stronger. And, you know, maybe they help us move and we water their plants when they're gone on vacation. And that cycle continues and just feeling, I think it's helped us feel rooted wherever we've been. And that the place where we are, we feel so so much a part of it because walking and biking it does keep our radius smaller I won't say any anything we can do it that's not true that we've had to say no to things and things like extra activities for our kids when my son was the age where lots of people were starting those I had an infant and we just said no that was going to complicate our family's life and we didn't want to and in some ways it's been, sometimes it has been hard to say no, but overall, I think that helps us keep things simple and helps us live these other values that we have of prioritizing our family. And when you keep your radius small, I think that helps build those community connections because you're seeing people out walking and biking and our life isn't distributed across a big metroplex. Our life is fairly contained. So, It's not that it's not challenging or that there aren't downsides to it, but I think the times that we've had to say no are the time, the things that it's brought to us and the positive aspects of it far outweigh that part of it. Right. You don't feel like you're, even though in the moment you might say, oh, I'm missing out, but then overall your life has been so enhanced by it that you don't feel like you've, you're missing out. You know, in the absolutely, yeah, I get that. So, where can people find you? Because I know that uh, your new podcast has. Do you have two episodes out as of right now? I think. I do two episodes, and then you also have friendlier. So yeah, tell everybody where they can find you and more about just this awesome community you're building online. I think it's great because I guarantee you there are so many people out there that. They either want to experiment with this, because I'm telling you right now, I want to go buy a bike. I've been wanting a bike for a (laughs) while. We live in a very bikeable community. We're in a college town. And all three of my kids have a bike, and I have not bought a bike yet. 
So I'm going to go buy a bike. <laughs> anyway. <I love> <laughs> uh, well, you and Kate have been such an inspiration. I feel like you guys have really created that community as well around living values and finding people who are making these choices that are different that I think makes people feel less alone yeah. when they're wanting to strike out and try something new. I, so. um, thank you for telling me that. Because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, um, yeah, that, that was the hope. And that was, I'm glad to hear that, that that's how you feel. So um, I know that everyone's going to want to know where they can find you. So why don't you tell everybody yes. that? So I have two podcasts. Friendlier comes out every other Tuesday. And that one is with a friend. We have a conversation every time talking about books that we're reading, food that we're eating, and then a variety of topics that a different one every week, things like minimalism or guilty pleasures or how we get around. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, and then Family Petals comes out on the opposite Tuesdays. And that one is the interview based podcast where I am interviewing families who are living car free and car light. And I'm trying to incorporate a lot of different perspectives. I have somebody who lives in the suburbs of Phoenix and a family in Vancouver and a family who does bike camping here. So trying to get that, you don't have to live in the urban core to make it work, that there are so many ways, even if you're not doing it full time, but just wanting to incorporate more of that into your life. So I would, I would love to connect with all of your listeners and you can also find me on Instagram at Family Petals and at Friendlier Podcast. Very cool. I'm really excited to hear all those interviews because, like you said, even if it's not just a full time thing, it's something that you're incorporating it more. Because I know that's we as a family, we are really, really wanting to do that. And since we homeschool, a lot of the things that we're doing are within our community base, just a few miles from us or a mile from us, really. And so, yeah. Maybe you'll be interviewing me in a few weeks. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I would love to. And I think that it's one of those things that it just, it builds on itself. Yeah. That once you start doing it, there are so many positive benefits and oftentimes unexpected ones that I think that it makes you want to do it more once you get started. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with our listeners. I know that they're going to get a lot from this. Thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to today's interview with Sarah Copper. You can find links to her two podcasts and blog in our show notes. And if you're enjoying our interview series, can you drop us a review on iTunes? We love and appreciate it so much when you do. See you next time.